I'm David Breeden, the Senior Minister of First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis, and I have a member of the Society with me today, Fred Olson. Fred, tell us a little bit about yourself to start things off. Well, I grew up in a small town in Iowa, uh, about 200 people, where my folks had a small store, and so people came in the store and we knew lots of the people in town. Um, I went to college in Ames, Iowa, Iowa State, and uh, in the 1960s, and that was a formative experience. Uh, after college, I uh, came to Northfield, Minnesota, where I met my now partner of 45 years or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, after she went to medical school, we came to Minneapolis, and we've been here for 45 years or so. Okay. So, All right. Well, I, I hear you already talking about a little bit about one of the topics I know that you care a lot about, which is community. Yes. And uh, so you, uh, you, you have some nostalgic feeling, I, uh, I think, from the, maybe the small town. America. The small town was certainly a factor in that. Um, I mean, like, like everything, there are pluses and minuses to small towns, but certainly the feeling of knowing most of the people and you know, knowing something about their lives and you know, doing things with them and you know, who to call on and to get things done and that kind of thing certainly was an influence on my later uh, involvement in more intentional community uh, where, I mean, in the way America has evolved, many people don't know their neighbors kind of the stereotype and, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, I have been involved in something called co-housing, which is an attempt to build communities, neighborhoods from the ground up. Uh, mm. And it's based on single family housing. Uh, usually, theoretically smaller than uh, the average housing because you have a common house that has lots of facilities. So you don't, for example, need to have a guest room because there's a guest room in the common house that can be shared. Uh. Um, the common house has room for uh, dining for the community, although everybody has their own kitchen normally. Um, but uh, and it's all done self-help. That uh, that is the the people who want to live there make it happen. And there are a lot more attempts to make it happen than succeed. Succeed, but the process of making it happen makes the community a very. You know, they get to, people get to know each other and work and learn how to work together and so on. Um, so. I've been involved in co-housing for 20 plus years, although we don't live in co-housing. Um, we live in an inner city neighborhood in North Minneapolis. And uh, we had lived there for a number of years. I misspoke, we've been there for 35 year plus years. Um, and I consider it one of the best blocks in the, in the city. Um, mm -hmm. We've had a block club, which is a sort of similar kind of, of uh, motivation for having an organization for the people who live on the block. Hmm. Uh, typically, 20% are actively involved, but more in one time or another. And we meet every other month and we do things together, uh, the national night out and the oh. kind of thing, and mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. uh, cleaning up trash and uh, occasional video night and a, occasional potluck supper and that kind of thing. Um, and getting to know each other is also a, a way to improve the safety on the neighborhood. We watch out for each other mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. thing and so on. So, right. Um, so um, co-housing, uh, some of this does exist in the United States. It seems yeah. like a kind of un-American idea, <laughs> so, uh, rugged individualism the, sort of thing. Well, and the, the idea came from Denmark where it was uh, sort of developed in the 70s and a couple of architects from California went and were studying uh, architecture in Denmark and happened to cross co-housing and found it very interesting and decided to write a book about it. So in 1988 they wrote a book called Co-Housing um, and uh, actually the term co-housing is a kind of an American term because the Danish term is hard to pronounce. <laughs> um, and the idea spread from there and it certainly isn't for everybody. Uh, it's a relatively small portion of the population are likely to be interested but you know not, you know, there's enough 
that there are about 120 or so communities developed in the U.S. now ah. in the last 20 some years. Uh, interestingly, there are very few in the Twin Cities. Um, there's really only one, and we debate why. Um, I want to, I mean, there's way of no, no real way of knowing, but one of my speculations is that, uh, well, as it happens that most of the people who've been interested in co-housing and involved that I know of have been lived in the city, as, in, as opposed to in the suburbs. And getting a new, uh, you know, it's usually done new construction, not always, but new, usually. And that means you have to have a chunk of land uh, to build uh, 40 or 30 or so townhouse-like things or so uh -huh. on. Mm -hmm. So that land is usually more available in the suburbs. So in the country, that has been more likely, and in Denmark for that matter, uh, it tends to be not in the inner city. Um, and But the people in Minnesota who've been mostly interested have been people who lived in the city. Hmm. So that disconnect there. And also, hmm. Uh, people in Minnesota or in Minneapolis, uh, neighborhoods like their neighborhoods usually. They, you know, there's a lot of block clubs and community organizations and so on. And the nature of co-housing is that people have to decide to move to one place to be part of it. Uh -huh. And that means that you probably have to move from your neighborhood. <laughs> and so okay. people are reluctant to do that. I mean, this is just a guess at mm -hmm. why it is. And also, it takes somebody who's committed and has the skills and time to make it happen, to organize it, to, you know, because it's a, typically a few million dollar project to make it happen. And, you know, you have to get the financing and find the land and organize things and get all of the permits and find the construction, mm -hmm. uh, you know, company or consultants or whatever. So, uh, so consequently, somehow or other, there is very little co-housing in the Twin Cities. My involvement with it is through the internet. Um, I happened to start a discussion about it in 1993 and uh, had early access to the internet and started it as a mailing list or listserv and it's been going for 20 plus years now Wow! and I think we have, I don't know, 35,000 messages or something and all kinds of topics Hmm. related to getting it built, living there, problems that developed, whatever. Um, and I, my role has been basically just behind the scenes, you know, getting it organized, you know, uh, helping people get onto the list and informing people when they have questions and, you know, screening messages so we've got a very good record of keeping spam off and uh, so on. Uh, but well, also, uh, and again, I think I'll, I'll come back to that idea of community. I know that uh, you you are very interested and involved in public transportation as well. Yeah, I uh, I actually did a little graduate. I, I, my undergraduate degree is in math, and uh, never really went anywhere with that. But got interested in urban transportation when. Uh, I lived in Des Moines for a while and there was a proposal to cut a swath of land diagonally northwest to build a freeway. And that seemed like a stupid thing to me, to d disturb all kinds of neighborhoods just so people could drive their cars faster. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved in, in the opposition to that and then got to looking around and found out that there were some federally funded programs for mass transportation. And uh, there was one at the University of Minnesota, and by that time I was had the connection at Carleton with my now partner, and uh, realized that there was one in Ames, or in Iowa City, Iowa. Um, and so I went there for a year and discovered that trans, uh, mass transportation is not primarily a technological issue. It's primarily a social issue, and the United States is not particularly open to public transportation and mm. so on. And so I concluded that they didn't really have a very good handle on how to promote it. So mm. I, I didn't pursue it much further, but I continue with the, the interest and am a long time bicyclist. Mm. And um, I see the bike on your shirt as a matter of fact. Uh, yes, this is the uh, t-shirt from Nice Ride, which is the Twin Cities bicycle sharing system. Um, there are 
have been over the years many attempts to do bicycle sharing systems and mm -hmm. uh, this one um, has come up with a system that works and um, has been going for several years now. Um, I'm actually a, a promoter and a critic of the system. The way they got it to work is that it's uh, highly controlled and you have to have a credit card to use it and there's a subscription fee and so um, and there's you can use the bike for 30 minutes before you have to bring it back without incurring further fees and so on mm -hmm. and um, all of those things mean that they have pretty good control over the bicycles and who has them and and, and the credit card and so on give them strong incentive to bring them back other looser more loosely organized bike systems have had problems with the bikes you know kind of disappearing and and uh, capacity problems and so on and uh, in 1999 I went to Denmark and Sweden for that matter and visited co-housing and one of the things I saw there was the, the uh, Copenhagen bike sharing system which uh, had a, a deposit of a coin they happened to have a coin that was worth about three dollars at the time and you put that in kind of like maybe if you've been to Aldi where they have the you know the deposit and so people bring back to get their deposit mm -hmm. and so on and mm -hmm. uh, there the issue from my perspective was primarily capacity that is if you didn't get up early in the morning there weren't any bikes available <laughs> if you got up early in the morning you could get a bike so uh, anyway. interesting, interesting. Um, I, I would love to see the Twin Cities system have come up with a way that combined the security aspects with a much shorter term usage way of it say a dollar or two a, a ride um, mm -hmm. So, that because a lot of people, particularly visitors, you know, it doesn't make sense to subscribe for I think it's six dollars for twenty-four hours to ride across town. I mean, it just, right, you know, right, so, yeah. So, but you know, maybe it'll evolve that direction to have a, a, and and also for poor people, it doesn't work that well. They've they've tried some things, but yeah. Yeah. but in the Twin Cities, I mean, it, it we, at least we're going in the oh, direction yes. of su of, oh, yes, of definitely. alternatives to just the car. Definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah. I'm, pr I'm more a supporter of Nice Ride than a critic, but I am a critic yeah. as well. But you and have your own bike, I know. Uh, yeah, I, I actually was a subscriber to Nice Ride for only one year. I found that I just didn't ride the thing. I mean, it was just so much easier for me to ride the bike. Now, the, the people for whom Nice Ride is works best are people who get to downtown or denser parts of the city regularly like if they may commute by bus or whatever and then want to get around downtown some and and so you can mm -hmm. take a bike and mm -hmm. you know and you, you if you do that you know a relatively few number of times it's worth subscribing for a year for i think it's 50 60 bucks now and you know use the bike and so on mm -hmm. but uh for me i live two miles from downtown and it makes much more sense for me to just take my own bike and so on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well and you have a bike i know yeah. and actually for the last five years i've been re riding recumbent bicycles which are uh, uh, from my point of view the way bicycles should be made but they're very different than the conventional upright bicycle they, Imagine a lawn chair with uh, you're kind of <laughs> laid back and your feet stretched out in front and the pedals are out front of you and you don't have to hunch your neck to see and your back is supported and uh, mm -hmm. they're a much more comfortable way to ride a bicycle. But it does take some getting used to it. Oh yes, they're, they're, they're different. I tell people it's a bit like learning to ride a bicycle for the first time. You know, you have to learn the, the dynamics and, the, and so on. And, but once you get used to it, it's great. Okay. So, so you, 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 it supports the body better is what you Well, you have you a back. You okay. You have a, uh, imagine a lawn chair, you mm -hmm. know, where, and, okay. and it has a back, and you sit back, and your handlebars are either up here or down at your side, okay. and a much more natural position, and just, yeah. uh, there's, there's a fair number of them around, but they're a very small percentage. I, I actually got mine uh, used online through Craigslist, and Craigslist has a very active uh, used bicycle thing, oh. and about one percent is my estimate of the ones that are advertised are recumbents and so if you just you know keep looking you'll find some and okay. so i, I purchased right. two there my, ah. the bike i ride now is a relatively light 25 pound bicycle but it's 15 years old but it's in great shape ah. Yeah. Ah. well I, that brings me to another topic i know you're very interested in which is frugal lifestyles yes um Americans in general use well over their share of the resources of the, of the world and 
so on, and I f feel strongly that that's inappropriate and my approach is to try and live as simply as reasonable. And so bicycling is one part of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, is, again, is it your uh, Iowa uh, upbringing, or did it hit you one day, uh, reading Thoreau, or how did you decide to be, be frugal? Because it is a, well, a, a, a countercultural choice oh, yes, in the United States. Yes. Uh, my guess is that the biggest single influence was my mother having grown up in the Depression. That's mm -hmm. my guess. Uh, it's, you know, my siblings don't share it. So that can't be the only determinant, but um, I don't know. It's I, I I can't quite explain where the commitment came from, but uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so you, you don't have a, a personal philosophy you can you can thumb on your thumbnail that you can uh, put out there about that. Huh? I don't usually come at it from that direction, at least. Okay. No. All right. So, but. But it, it is interesting that um, certainly uh, Henry David Thoreau, one of the great Unitarians, I mean, that was, mm -hmm. that was his basic belief is that we, we make our own trouble by, uh, mm -hmm. by uh, having to acquire new clothes as, as one, of, mm -hmm. one of, uh, of his examples. But I also know that you're uh, interested in uh, open source software. Ah, yes. Well, I um, have been a computer user since college and Got my own first computer in the late 80s. Uh, was it the late 80s? It might have been the late 70s, I guess, early 80s. And um, when open source came along, it was one of those ideas, kind of like co-housing, that you know had been kind of in the back of my head for a long time, and it just mm. seemed right. And and actually, that applies to Unitarianism too. It you know it kind of uh, puts a framework around what I already believed, kind of thing. The notion of open source software is that instead of a company writing software and then selling it, uh, a group of people will, or sometimes an individual, but typically a group is recruited to, to maintain it, and then it's um, basically made available to anybody, and the source code is made available as well. Now, most of us don't use the source code, but having it available means that should the situation uh, come along, it can be changed to fit my needs. And somebody mm -hmm. can't hold me hostage to mm -hmm. the software. Mm -hmm. And in these days, open source software is developed by pe groups of people around the world because they communicate over the internet and they put out um, copies of the software and people comment on it and point out problems and they get fixed and so on. And, it's, uh, it, and, it's, and though the software usually is free, in the sense that there's no money charged for it, it's also there's a notion of freedom that that people attach to it. So there are a couple couple of ways. Um, people have found ways to make a living at supporting the software. So if a an organization or a business or something needs special help to, you know, do a more professional job or special application, or they simply don't want to do it themselves, they can hire people who specialize in maintaining a particular piece of software and so on. So there. You know, it's not an all-volunteer thing, and in fact, there are companies that do proprietary software that also support open-source software. And um, there are an, a number of very prominent open-source software packages around that people use widely without knowing it. Um, hmm. The internet largely runs on open-source servers that uh, are the things that make the internet work. So mm -hmm. the, um, the web servers and so on. And there's op there are operating systems that are comparable to Windows or Macintosh in, in for, all, for a high percentage of the use that are open source. I use uh, one called, uh, called Linux, but Linux has many different versions. And I use a version called Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is a South Africa or an African term that is hard to describe in a few words, but it basically means a community uh, supported sort of thing. And um, it's, it's now probably the most widely used uh, Linux version. Hmm. Well, and one of the things that I've read about, uh, about open source is that um, actually they tend to be more accurate. I mean, you would, you would think that uh, a Microsoft product would uh, 
written specifically by one person or a team of people who had one direction would be in some way more efficient, but it doesn't tend to be that way. Well, I guess I would be reluctant to make such a claim because how do you prove it? Well, um, but uh, open source software does tend to be very good. Um, so, you know. Yep. I mean, wi and, Wikipedia, and, for example. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, Wikipedia is open know, source. Yeah, yeah. and uh, probably by now the most widely known. Yeah, um, and well, and the it has the advantages of that there are this huge group of people out there who are keeping an eye on things, and when somebody reports a problem, and they it can be fixed. Mm -hmm. You know, security holes are fixed pretty quickly, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. They still happen, but. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, there, are, there is speculation that actually this is changing the way people uh, even perceive of information, that uh, by the fact that uh, we have so much information available, number one, obviously we can look up anything nowadays pretty well on the mm -hmm. internet, but two, that uh, information is interactive. I can go on to Wikipedia mm -hmm. and no, I, I do need to know something about it. I can't make stuff up, but if I have some expertise, I can join the human project mm. of constructing this. Yes, although Wikipedia has all kinds of, of uh, procedures in place to avoid people doing self-promotion and, mm -hmm. and that kind of mm -hmm. thing, but mm -hmm. definitely. I, I have done very little initiating of things on Wikipedia, but I fix things. Uh -huh. You know, I run across something that's you know, out of date or whatever and fix things. So. Oh, yeah, interesting. Not, not extensively, but some. Yep. Well, again, it's it, it, there is a community. It's a yeah. huge. It's a, it's a worldwide community oh, yeah. at this point, but it is uh, it is a community of, mm -hmm. of users. I uh, um, there's not a day goes by that I don't use Wikipedia that, uh, for yeah. some for yeah. one thing or another in yeah. research. And That's, and and it's such a a gold mine of stuff that you you start one place and you end up someplace <laughs> else. And you get, How did I get here? You, you know, it's like, oh yeah. Yep, absolutely. Well, I also know that you're a, a ham radio, speaking of, again, communities, uh, a ham radio operator. Yes. And I'm interested uh, because um, I wonder what the impact of uh, contemporary technology that's certainly br been bringing the world together mm -hmm. uh, in communication, but uh, at one time ham radio was, was that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, ham radio still gets uh, notice when there's a disaster and hams are the first ones to establish communication when somebody gets isolated because of whatever mm. natural disaster or something. Uh, hams have, like everybody else, adopted computer technology extensively and mm. so there's there's still lots of people experimenting with all kinds of things. Um, on the other hand it has impacted some of our technologies. Uh, for many years we were uh, my, my partner and I used uh, ham radio just for our mobile communications, this before cell phones and so on, and we basically stopped doing that because it just is not so convenient anymore. Hmm. Although I'm thinking about putting radio back in the car. <laughs> By the way, we have one car. Uh, ah. That's our, our compromise to... Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> and um, there was a system of, that we used uh, Called two, we usually call it two meters, which is roughly the wavelength of the VHF signal that was used, mm. which uh, uh, hams have a bunch of different frequencies assigned to them in little blocks, and they have different propagation characteristics, where they, you know, how far the signal will go and so on. Some of them, the oldest ones, you could communicate around the world, but not reliably. You'll hear references to HF and so on. We used VHF, which is where uh, broadcast television used to be before digital, and had kind of a metropolitan kind of coverage, you know, 10 miles, depending on your antennas and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used it mobile and from handhelds and so on. And, and that's taken, the usage there has taken quite a hit because of uh, cell phones. And so it's now, uh, and it, and, but it was a very different kind of thing than cell phone because it was, uh, it was inherently group oriented. That is, you would get on and, and say, you know, give your call sign and say anybody around and, you know, one person might come back, but you might get three people or you might have a group discussion. Mm -hmm. And there were 
oh, back quite a few years ago, I would ride my bicycle to work and have a handheld and communicate with other people who are commu commuting to work and so on. <laughs> um, one thing that has evolved is now a way to interconnect repeaters, because there still are a fair number of them around. Oh, today, it's not unusual to get on a repeater and put out a call saying anybody around and get a response, because there just aren't that many out mm. there using it. One thing that has developed is uh, internet-based interconnection of repeaters. And so now you can talk to other people around the world. But in my personal opinion, we haven't, they haven't worked out the user interface very well. We need to have a way to say, anybody around who wants to communicate in English from anywhere in the world, but so far they don't have a handy way to do that. So. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So and then, then you'd have behind the grounds a server would connect two people who, who said I want to talk to somebody and say so you might be talking to somebody in Australia or whatever. But it hasn't happened yet, but one of these days. Oh, okay. Well, um, you you uh, just uh, briefly mentioned uh, uh, Unitarianism and your kind of your faith journey, if you will. Um, what brought you to uh, Unitarian Universalism and humanism? Well, uh, number one. <sighs> Humanism really is what I arrived at on my own, I guess. Um, you know, it just seems like the logical way to go to me. Mm. And, but the, the big, bigger factor is that my partner was raised Unitarian. Ah, and that's rare. <laughs> yes. And uh, her, her folks became Unitarians in Massachusetts, where Unitarian, there's lots of Unitarians around. And once we got settled here, um, she decided to join the Unitarian Society, First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And I was a friend for maybe 20 years. And nobody ever asked me to join. <laughs> and um, when our son was a teenager and we were encouraging him to participate, uh, it, this suggestion came that maybe it would make more sense for you to join. So I joined in 2002, <laughs> finally. So. so you were kind of hanging back a little bit I was there, a fellow right? traveler for a long okay. time. Okay, all right, all right. But, so. but you, you were saying uh, that you had kind of thought your way into, did you grow up in a, uh, in a church tradition as a kid? Uh, my, well, I grew up in this small town, which my folks moved to when I was one year old or something, and there was only one church in town, so it was kind of a community uh -huh. church. Uh, it was uh, affiliated with the Presbyterians, although not strongly Presbyterian in, in focus and so on, and mm. so I grew up there. And, um, actually, when I got to college, I somehow got connected with the American Baptists who are very progressive mm -hmm. on the wide spectrum of Baptists. Mm -hmm. And um, that association kind of um, led me on my journey partway. And, um, and I knew some Unitarians um, in, in Ames, because they met at the YMCA where I lived for a while. And uh, actually, the producer of this program uh, and I had contact back then, which we only discovered recently when he uh, was the resource person <laughs> at a um, conference in 1968 about abortion. <laughs> okay, so I've had so. some contact over the years, but it was clearly Becca was the, the uh, immediate connection. Uh, so, so free thinking, uh, it, it, your, your kind of path on the free thinking. Uh, well, we've got about 15 seconds to get it. Do you have any... Uh, Last uh, reflection for uh, folks. Not really. Get, get on that. Get, get on that bike. <laughs> yes. Fred Olson, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Mm -hmm. I'm David Breeden. I'm uh, the uh, senior minister of First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis. Thanks for joining us.